Uh, the subject is, can capitalism be fixed? And I think my en entire working life has been devoted to trying to answer that question. And I still don't really have a complete answer to it, but I want to kind of take you along a little bit uh, in the way, OK, that's better. I was afraid that you were saying if I got too close, the room would explode. So I, I don't want that to happen. So. But uh, my concern with all of this and with the failings of this system we call capitalism or more euphemistically free enterprise uh, started when I was the age of the college students in this room. I went as a freshman to the University of California at Berkeley when it was absolutely free. So those of you who Though those who tell you that we can't make college education free ought to know that we were doing it 40-some years ago, and we were doing it when I went to college. Uh, that was the year of the free speech movement, so that was my ba baptism in politics and in getting interested in the free speech movement really was a fight for the right to have tables to organize civil rights campaigns. Uh, in local businesses to make sure that those businesses were not discriminating. I went from the uh, University of California into VISTA and became a, a, a VISTA volunteer on a, an American Indian reservation in northern Wisconsin where I was really exposed to poverty in America and what it looked like and also to another side certainly of racism. Went from there to the University of Wisconsin and this was the days of the Vietnam war movement and so we didn't do a lot of studying we did a lot of demonstrating and we were out day after day trying to fight this war and we were also becoming more and more concerned about the problems of pollution and environmental damage we didn't know yet quite about global warming but we did know about pollution and some of those things that were going on and so like many students of my generation including Nick, Nick Licata who spoke last time I joined the Students for a Democratic Society SDS at the University of Wisconsin. In the days that SDS was still what you might call a social democratic organization before it kind of exploded into various forms of uh, Marxism and, and more uh, sort of extreme, uh, you might call it communist politics, but uh, at, in those days SDS was still kind of a social democratic left liberal organization following the Port Huron statement, the wonderful document written in 1962. But for all of us, I think the big turning point was the year 1968, when things that looked very promising went terribly sour. We saw the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., followed by the assassination of Robert Kennedy, who was running for president in a campaign against the war. We saw the smashing of our hopes at the Chicago Convention in 1968, when the reform candidates were uh, defeated and the young people who demonstrated were basically uh, attacked by a police riot and, and clubbed in the streets. We also saw on the other side of the world another disappointing thing when the Russian troops marched in the same week as the Chicago Convention, marched into Czechoslovakia and stopped the movement for a more democratic socialism in Czechoslovakia. And so we knew that capitalism had failed, but we didn't know what might replace it. Uh, we didn't look to the social democracies of Northern Europe, to the middle way of Scandinavia and so forth. We thought of those places as kind of bourgeois and boring and all of this. So where did we look? We looked to the third world countries, especially countries like Cuba. So in 1970, I traveled as part of the Venceremos Brigade to work in the sugar, uh, in the uh, cane, not, sorry, <laughs> in citrus production in uh, Cuba. And on the 8th of October, 1970, I had the opportunity to stand in the plaza of the revolution in Havana with a million people and listen to Cas uh, Fidel Castro eulogize the third anniversary of the death of Che Guevara. And we were very excited about the things that looked like they were happening in Cuba and other things. But 25 years ago, the Soviet system, and the system that in some ways propped up to a degree places like Cuba, collapsed. State, state socialism essentially failed, and the conservatives who were saying, look, this is actually existing socialism, that's what they called it, uh, they were triumphant, or they at least felt they were triumphant, but in the next few years, 
capitalism also failed and failed badly. And we see the results. Enormously increasing inequality, climate change, all kinds of, of serious problems. I don't have to go into them. You know about them. So what can we do? Well, what is the next system? Bernie Sanders points to Scandinavia. He calls it democratic socialist. I agree um, that, that probably a better term for this is a social democracy or social democratic organizations. And I believe that we have a great deal to learn from these social democracies, that the things that they have done and the best practices in these places will be an essential part of any new system that we try to create. So we were very mistaken when we didn't look there and we didn't see what was going on there in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And this time, we need to take a closer look. Some of those best practices include things like a strong social safety net, Shorter work time, which is an issue I have been working on for a long time. I'm running an organization called Take Back Your Time. We want to give Americans vacations, which they don't have, and every other country in the world does by law. We want to give people sick leave and family leave, and all of these kind of reforms are absolutely essential, and people have them in other capitalisms. There are enormous differences between capitalisms, and that has to be understood. Capitalism is not one system. Capitalism is a variety of many systems. We, uh, they have more pro progressive taxation. They do more uh, for the environment. They have things like co-determination in Germany, where workers elect half of the board of directors of corporations, or works councils, where workers actually make decisions uh, on the shop floor about the organization of labor and of work. We need to do those things, and we need to, to, to look at those ideas. But we need a different uh, model, and we actually have a historical one here in the US. So I want to finish my remarks by pointing that out and asking you to think about it. The traditional American model of the next system, the new idea, was a thing called the cooperative commonwealth. Some of you may have heard of that. Maybe many of you haven't. It was a system, essentially, of three tiers, a public control of monopoly industries, of the large industries run by, uh, by the public through, uh, through the state, but, but democratically, uh, things like public banks, a l very large middle cooperative sector of producer and consumer co-ops with also input from the communities and neighborhoods where they existed, and a vibrant small business, regulated but small business sector, which was a small private capitalist sector. We don't need the state to run little restaurants. We don't need the state to do many of these little kinds of things, which clearly can be done better and easier at the private level. So the cooperative commonwealth is those two words. It emphasizes cooperation instead of competition, and it emphasizes the idea that the resources of this land are a commonwealth which belongs to all of us and which we need to use and run in common. It's, it's not a uh, a foreign term, we have four states that call themselves commonwealth. Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Kentucky, for example. So it is a positive vision of a different kind of society, call it what you want, but I like the term cooperative commonwealth. Uh, and I think it's, it's where, what we need to think about again. And we have a positive model right here in the state of Washington for using that language and that idea to move a progressive agenda forward. That model was called the Washington Commonwealth Federation. And it was established in the 1930s, 1932 here in Seattle, ex uh, actually, with the goal of taking over the state Democratic Party for a democratic socialist or social democratic agenda. And for a time, the, cooperative, uh, the Washington Commonwealth S Federation succeeded in doing just that. It became the Democratic Party in the state of Washington. It elected people to the legislature. It elected people to Congress and so forth. So I think that I'm not against third parties, and I think building uh, efforts to build them, particularly on the local level, have value. But I think we also need to use that, the existing party. And I think the next steps for the Bernie Sanders people, and Bernie has, has moved this dialogue about the problems of capitalism forward enormously, 
is to rebuild the Democratic Party as a Commonwealth Federation, to rebuild the Washington Commonwealth Federation in this state with different values and different ideas, and therefore really to change our society. And it wasn't just here, the state of Minnesota had a farmer labor party whose goal was the cooperative commonwealth. The cooperative commonwealth federation in Canada, which controlled the governments of Saskatchewan and Manitoba and Ontario, was the organization that brought to Canada its single payer health care system under the leadership of Tommy Douglas, the premier of Saskatchewan. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have a lot of ideas here in our own tradition and our own history. We need to learn that history and there's a, there's a point in which history ought to be repeated and we ought to think about that. Thank you.